tuning in to the Postmodern Realities Podcast brought to you by the Christian Research Institute and the Christian Research Journal. I'm Melanie Cogdill, Managing Editor of the Christian Research Journal. It's October 2023, and this is episode 362, which is a conversation about Edgar Cayce. On this episode, I'm joined by Lindsay Maddenwalt. She's Director of Ministry Operations at Mama Bear Apologetics, and she serves as a consulting editor for the Christian Research Journal. Lindsay has a master's in apologetics and ethics from Denver Seminary, a JD from St. Mary's School of Law, and a master's in public administration from Midwestern State University. Lindsay has written an online exclusive feature article about Edward Casey, and her article is called Edgar Casey, the Would-Be Sleeping Prophet, and you can read her article for free at equip.org. Lindsay, it's good to have you on again. Hi, Melanie. It's so good to be here. Well, as I said in the intro, Lindsay has written a feature article for the website about Edgar Casey. Now, some of our listeners might not be super familiar with him, but he's normally associated with the occult, and now it's October, so this is a good time when people are kind of dabbling into occult things to talk about some of the roots of well-known occult or new age practitioners and those kinds of things. And so first of all, who is he in just kind of an overview and why would you say he's important? In other words, why should Christians know about who Edgar Cayce is? I think that it's definitely to the season where people are thinking about the occult and wondering how it fits in in today's society, I think Christians should be aware that people are dabbling in things that perhaps they would never have imagined. And Edgar Cayce is one of the characters from the early 1900s who really made an impact on even the way that the occult is viewed today. I first learned about Edgar Cayce about five or six years ago when I first started studying the New Age movement, I had heard about him first on the show Ancient Aliens, which is something that we've talked about before on this podcast. They had a segment about the lost city of Atlantis, and they featured a prophecy that Edgar Casey had made regarding Atlantis. And so that was the first time I really heard about him. And at the time, I was focusing on someone else, so I didn't do a deep dive on Edgar Casey or pay a whole lot of attention to him. But over the years, I've realized that his impact has actually been pretty far and wide, especially in people that we would consider new age today. He's also been called the father of holistic medicine. And that's sort of a buzzy word or a couple of words that we've been hearing make a resurgence in our culture If some of our listeners maybe don't know what holistic medicine is, it's when a person's whole health is taken into account when figuring out how to treat them from whatever ailment they might have. And a lot of times it includes recommendations that are as simple as relieve your stress or have a better diet or do more exercise. And those are all good things for us, but um, they kind of go by the wayside. They let the rest of medicine kind of sit on the other side. Now, the Christian Research Journal actually ran an article uh, by Dr. Paul Reiser back in 2009 about alternative medicine. So our listeners could listen to that or read that and get more information about holistic medicine. But in addition to being called the father of holistic medicine, Edgar Cayce has also been called one of the founders of New Age, which I don't actually necessarily agree with. I'm not sure the title fits, but I think he's more likely described to be as one of the key proponents of the New Age movement before it was actually called the New Age movement. He was a clairvoyant who claimed to be able to facilitate healings of people through his sleep. 
or a self-imposed hypnotic state. So this is how he received his most famous title and the one that I think will be prevalent throughout this podcast, The Sleeping Prophet. That's really interesting because I think we were talking about before the podcast began, you know, maybe some renewed interest in the New Age movement was kind of around the time of the 60s and 70s, the kind of the hippie movement, Woodstock, and people were dabbling in all kinds of different hallucinogenics and drugs and so forth. And they were experimenting with new things like holistic medicine and and those kinds of things, going back to Eastern religions and so forth. But now it's become so prevalent and so commonplace that things that we thought were kind of this fringe people believed is really made its way into the mainstream. So Edgar Casey for sure is a fascinating person. So tell our listeners a little bit more about his background, his upbringing. Sure. So Edgar Casey, he was born in March of 1877 and he was born in Kentucky. His parents uh, were, well, his family was a family of tobacco farmers. His dad ran a, a farming store and Edgar had four younger sisters. So it was kind of a regular family situation for a family growing up in in the late 1800s, early 1900s in you know, middle America. He wasn't born to a particularly religious family. They went to church. They raised him, his parents raised him in uh, Disciples of Christ denomination. He was interested in the Bible from an early age. In fact, he asked for a Bible and he was given a Bible. And as soon as his parents noticed the interest, they encouraged him to get involved in reading the Bible. By age 10, he had gotten baptized and he was committed to reading the Bible from cover to cover each year, which is something that I think all of our readers, all of our listeners and readers should, you know, do every year anyway. Uh, We should try to read the Bible as often as possible. He made it a goal of his to make a record in how many times he read the Bible, though. It was sort of a way he could brag about the way that he read the Bible. And interestingly, his dad called him dull and dim-witted, and yet he seemed to be an avid reader. So it kind of went against those two words uh, that they labeled him. He was also a terrible speller, which becomes pretty relevant in a minute when we talk about how his spirituality developed over the years. But I would say that Edgar's upbringing was pretty typical, and I don't think that you could have looked at his childhood and said, oh, I guess he's going to be in the new age one day. I don't think his parents really raised him in an environment where he would have dabbled in things otherworldly or outside of what scripture had dictated. So that to me is one of the most fascinating things, because if you know anything about Edgar Casey, and I don't know that I knew that much about him beyond some of the just, you know, new age and especially association, occultic associations with the occult before your article is that I would not have thought that he grew up in a Christian household and was reading the Bible. So for him to now be known as somebody who is an occult practitioner and new ager and promoter of these practices, how did he go from reading the Bible every year to being associated now what he's known for in terms of the occult and the new age. I think we could use Edgar Cayce as sort of a lesson for us to realize that at any point we could be manipulated into twisting scripture in our own lives or seeing things that are not actually there. In Edgar's case, when he was about 12 or 13, He was reading his Bible by the side of the creek in the woods, and he was approached by a woman he initially thought was his mother calling him home for dinner. But then he noticed that this woman had wings on her back and seemed to actually be an angel. And when she started talking, she told Edgar that she had heard his prayers. I don't know what his 
prayers were. There's no record of his exact prayers. And she wanted to know what exactly he wanted most of all in the world. And his response to her was that he wanted to help people, especially children. And I guess immediately after he said this, the woman disappeared, but Casey actually does hear from her a couple of more times in his lifetime. This event reminds me, incidentally, of Joseph Smith and his encounters with angelic beings or who he later called God and Jesus when he was in the woods as a teenager. But unlike Joseph Smith, Edgar Cayce didn't set out to create a whole religion based on his visions. But he did, like I said, make an impact that was going to be felt even today. The encounter with this lady with wings was really a turning point for Edgar and his life. So tell us a little bit more about just how this woman influenced him, because that's really interesting. You come across this person when you're an early teenager, so probably middle schooler. Right. Yeah, he was definitely young, and I can't imagine what it must have been like to be 12 or 13 years old and have a vision like that. And uh, we obviously weren't there. We don't know what his experiences were. But like I said, it impacted his life greatly. And I really think a shift happened in him that day. He had previously done quite poorly in school. And his uncle, who was his teacher, they had a one-room schoolhouse at the time. His uncle was his teacher, and his uncle used to lament about how terrible of a student he was. He was consistently at the bottom of the class. And One day he had done particularly poor in school and word had gotten back to his father. When he got home, his father said, we are sitting down and we are studying this spelling and you will not leave until we've got it down. He couldn't figure it out and just kept failing at the spelling despite his father's efforts. His father got annoyed and said, I'm going to go get a drink of water. Why don't you get ready for bed and left the room. Then Edgar heard the woman from the creek in his in his head, I guess, a voice. And it was the same voice from the creek. And that voice told Edgar to take a quick nap and have the book under his head while he slept. When he woke up, apparently Edgar could not only spell all of the words that he had been practicing for hours with his father, but he could spell all of the words and all in every lesson that was going to come after it. He had somehow memorized the book while he slept. And that was a moment, I guess, for him in realizing, okay, maybe I have something special or I'm called to something greater. He also started noticing strange things like he could see his grandfather walking around the house, even though his grandfather had died years before. So he started seeing his grandfather's ghost. And most of his friends turns out that they were imaginary and nobody else could see them. And, and this was obviously a problem socially for him. And his parents did voice their concerns regarding his social status at school because not only did they think he was dumb, but now he has imaginary friends and he's seeing ghosts. I think a major point for him past the woman at the, the creek was a moment at school when he was playing on the playground and he got hit with a baseball. And he said that he it was intense pain, but he made it through the rest of the day. And when he got home, he just couldn't handle it anymore. Uh, he went to bed and his parents heard him muttering some words and they started listening to what he was saying. And he actually muttered the words of a healing for his own body and told them how to heal his body. They followed his instructions and apparently in the morning there was no evidence that he had ever been injured, despite the fact that he was definitely injured the day before. I think all of these events in his early childhood really fashioned and molded the way that his life progressed and the direction that he took in the next 40 years or so. 
I've got to give a shout out to D Carter 72, who back in August gave us our most recent review on Apple Podcasts. And that is always such an encouragement when someone does that because I know that they like this podcast and they want to help other people like it. So here's what D Carter 72 said. The subject is so relevant and gets right to the topic. This person said, I love the variety of topics and examining current culture through the Christian worldview. The question and answer format is great and the writers, guests are very knowledgeable. I also appreciate that they get right to the topic and don't waste the first five to 15 minutes doing useless chit chat and inside humor that so many podcasts do. And I have to say, as a podcast listener, while I don't mind that in some of my podcasts, that is true that some of the podcasts that are an hour long or more, there's a lot of banter at the beginning and they don't get to the topic of the podcast. And so we want to give you not the banter, but a full hour or whatever the length of the podcast is of pure content. So we hope that you are encouraged like D Carter 72. And if you are, could you please do us a favor and rate and review us on Apple Podcasts? Because that's the main platform when searches come up on the internet where people can see how things are rated. So if you could do that, that'd be great because it's been a couple of months since we received a rating. We've got 77 ratings total. Some of them are just starred ratings, which is fabulous too. We're really thankful for that. And if you could give us a rating or review, we'd be really grateful. Now, today, as you know, I'm talking to John Ferrer. We're talking about horoscopes, but we have some other kind of October culturally relevant topics. Next week, we're going to do a super deep dive on Edgar Cayce, who's really known for occultism. And I found out some really interesting things about his spiritual background that I did not know at all. It's going to be a fascinating podcast with Lindsay Medenwalt next week. You don't want to miss that. And then we have another podcast coming up on horror films with our regular film reviewer, Cole Burgett. That's going to come up at the end of the month. So thank you for listening to this podcast, telling a friend, sharing it on your social media. And now back to my conversation with Lindsay Medenwald. Well, we've been talking about Edgar Cayce's background, and I just find that really fascinating that he was having basically visions and it was impacting what he thought his, you know, calling was. Here he was, you know, very young, 13. So what was his educational um, background, you know, from that time going forward? And your article mentioned that he was not continuing in school. Is that correct? Yes. He quit school. It, it's a little murky in the history books, but he either quit school after eighth grade or after ninth grade. And it depends on which biography you read as to which grade you want to pick. But it wasn't that atypical for somebody in the working class to quit school at that time so that then they could continue to work with their family in whatever family business they had. So farming families, they would typically have their boys go farm after they left school and the girls would go and learn the trade and help raise the family from home. And, and so, like I said, not that atypical that he left school between eighth and ninth grade. Uh, so he didn't want to be a tobacco farmer, even though that's kind of where his family had come from. He did spend a few years working on his grandparents' farm, but the lady from the creek returned to him once more during work one day and said, this is not your calling. Stop doing the farming and leave. And the way that he puts it in, in, in the biography that was written about him by uh, Thomas Suger is that he immediately quit his farming job at, at his grandparents' place and walked 13 or 14 miles uh, to take a new job at a bookstore. I don't know exactly what happened at that moment and how his brain adjusted to, okay, I've heard this voice. It told me to quit, so I'm just going to obey it and leave, but he did. And ultimately, he continued to take odd jobs like bookstores for a while. There was one incident that I heard, that I read about, where he 
actually met Dwight Moody, who uh, told him that he should maybe be a minister because he was so interested in scriptures. But at this point, Casey was not making a lot of money and didn't have money to go to school to become a minister. So he told Dwight Moody this and uh, Mr. Moody responded and said, well, then you should just continue to study scriptures and spend as much time as you can in, in church. And so Edgar Casey became a Sunday school teacher and started to really spend a lot of time serving the people in his community through his church and through that Sunday school class. He did try to make money as an insurance salesman. And I think this was another moment in his life where he realized there was something different about him. He had been going from door to door selling insurance as they used to do. Uh, we do have people who sell things still, but it was more prevalent for, to have door to door salesmen back when he was younger. And he lost his voice. Now, I think we all know that salespeople need a voice in order to sell things. And so losing his voice was not going to make him the money that he needed to make to support him or his future family. And he went to doctors and no doctor could heal him. And so what he did, Melanie, was he heard a story about a traveling hypnotist who was coming to town. He went to his father and his doctor and said, hey, do you think that I should go visit this hypnotist and see if he can heal me? And they said, well, what have you got to lose? The reality is it costs $200 to have a consultation with this hypnotist, which I did the math and it seems like that's about $7,000 in today's money. So it was a lot of money for him to put forth, but he would only have to pay the hypnotist if he was actually healed. And so he went to the hypnotist and they put him under. And when he, when he was under, apparently he was able to speak. And that caught everybody off guard because he hadn't been able to do that for so long. I think it was 10 months at this time. And so when he woke up, his voice was gone again. And they said, well, that, that's weird. You were talking just fine when you were asleep. Why aren't you talking fine now? So they tried it multiple times and the healing wouldn't stick. He would wake up and his voice would be gone again. And the hypnotist said, well, I'm, I didn't heal you. I failed. And perhaps it's because you're not getting into a deep enough hypnotic state and I can't get you there. And I'm sorry. Well, Edgar did not want to give up. So he found a local hypnotist and went to this guy and said, I need you to help me. I can speak when I'm asleep, but I can't speak when I'm awake. And so the hypnotist told him how to do self-hypnosis and put himself to sleep. And so Edgar did that when he went home and put himself in a hypnotic state and figured out what was wrong with him. And then after diagnosing the problem, figured out how to heal himself. When he woke up, he miraculously could speak again. And that was an indication to him that he had an ability unlike anybody else he'd ever met. And his family was amazed. He obviously had amazed this hypnotist who had given him the advice. And I'm sure the hypnotist was like, it was not going to work, but you can try it. What have you got to lose? Uh, but yeah, I think that was a, a major point in Edgar Casey's life where he said, hmm, maybe this isn't normal, but it does work. And, and it, was, it was a problem for him that we'll get into in a minute. So these unconventional methods of healing, where did he think, you know, and, he, and you said he, he had the idea that he had special powers. Did he think that those powers came from God? Uh, not initially, no. He actually thought that they were from the devil. And he told his parents so. He said, I think that this is a problem and... I think that I am communing with dark spirits and I'm being used by the devil to do his work. And his mother just couldn't reconcile that as, as parents do. And as we've seen in culture where parents sometimes will kowtow to the culture if their kids are sinning uh, and, and then they say, well, maybe, maybe that's not sin after all. It seems like 
Edgar Casey's mom kind of fell into that pattern as well. Edgar Casey spotted the problem initially, stated the problem to his mom, and his mom said, no, Satan couldn't use a righteous person, and you're a righteous person, so therefore it's not dark powers. It's, it's good, and you should use it because it's good. And unfortunately, I think we do that today too, Melanie. It's not unusual for us to say, well, you know, I'm doing all of this for a good purpose. And as long as I continue to do it for a good purpose, then it, it can't be bad. And, and I think that's where Edgar Casey landed. And even though he accepted that from his mom, we can see in the patterns of his life that he continued to question whether or not his psychic abilities or his clairvoyance aligned with Christianity and his uh, foundational beliefs. And I think if we look at his life and he's not here to, to say how he ended, but if we were to ask him, you know, what do you think now? I think hopefully he would at the end of his life have said, you know what, that was probably not from God. And it's definitely being twisted now in a way that it's his, his words are being used for occultic practices, not, for the good of Christianity. I don't think anybody today would ever associate the name Edgar Casey with Christianity. I hope not. I, I've always thought of him as somebody who represented occult practices. Well, let's talk a little bit more because you said he got into some more holistic methods. He had this, he felt like he was cured by this hypnotist. Um, so, how did he kind of get into? maybe practice of that himself, not just being the recipient of someone, you know, being cured by these methods, but actually going on to practice them himself. Yeah. If you can heal yourself, why not try to heal other people? And that was an easy jump for him to make. He decided that he was going to use his so-called powers for good. And, and he did, he at least will, I want, I want the listeners to understand that when I say he did and when I'm talking about his powers, I'm not speaking about them as though I believe them or that he was uh, actually performing the things that he claimed to have performed. And we'll talk about that by the end of the podcast, but I want to make sure that our listeners have an understanding that when I am speaking about his powers and the things that he claimed to do, I am coming at it as a a skeptic and as a Christian looking back on it, not as a believer of Edgar Casey and what he claimed to have done. But as far as his healings go, he started working with that local hypnotist who said he could help him. And they started working together to heal the people in their community. Not everyone believed that they were able to complete these healings, including Edgar Casey's future wife, Gertrude. She was a skeptic from the very beginning, uh, but she basically told Edgar to do whatever it is that he wanted to do. And, and he, so he continued to do the healings. I think one of the reasons why she struggled with his so-called abilities was that he was unable to heal one of their children who died in infancy and that was a, a moment for, for Gertrude where she said, well, if, if you have the ability, why couldn't you do this? Why couldn't you save our son? And in later years, we'll see that Gertrude changes her mind when Edgar Casey makes a reading on her. She's diagnosed with tuberculosis and the illness is so bad that doctors have told her you are going to die. And they have told Edgar, there's no way she's going to live through this. And so she actually asked Edgar for a reading, said, I, I think this was a moment for her where she said, what have I got to lose? I might as well see if there's anything here for me. And he did this reading on her. And the recommendation was that she inhale the fumes of apple brandy. So the doctors put an apple, apple brandy on, on the fire and she put her face to it and inhaled the fumes of this apple brandy. And then miraculously, she was healed of her tuberculosis. 
never to suffer from it again. And that was amazing for Gertrude. Gertrude was amazed by that, as I, I think anybody would have been. And the second instance that I think Gertrude uh, really had a time where she said, okay, maybe there's something to this, is when their other son got uh, injured and Edgar was able to help him heal by making a simple suggestion uh, of incorporating some sort of ointment to put on his child's eye. And that helped him overcome an eye illness that he had. All of this put together put Gertrude in a place where she wanted to help Edgar help others. So she sort of became his uh, scribe, although he later hired somebody to do that. And, and Gertrude would just be the person to ask Edgar questions. I would like to explain for a minute how this worked, because I think we have this idea of hypnosis and, and somebody going under hypnosis, but we may not imagine how Edgar Casey did it. So I'd like to explain it for a second. Yeah, I wanted to ask you because you mentioned the word reading a few times and maybe yes. our listeners don't know what is a reading. What is a reading? It's it's um it's like if you were gonna go to a psychic or what you've seen on in movies or on television of psychic portrayals and 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 receiving a reading from them based on you know, what's in the cards, like tarot cards, or what's on your hands, and they tell you your future, or they tell you about your past. And it's similar to what Edgar Casey was doing, except that what would happen is he would lay down on the couch, and he would close his eyes, and he would put himself into what he called a hypnotic state. And observers would say that his eyes would sort of flutter, like he was in the REM cycle of his sleep. And it was at that time where the person who was speaking to him, most often it would be Gertrude, his wife, would give him the name and the location of the so-called patient that he was supposed to help heal. And it was during that time that he would say, okay, this person has this problem and this is how you heal. And then Gertrude would write down what he said and he would wake up from the state and Edgar would have no memory of anything that he had said. He would only be told what it was he was saying. And so I think that's another issue for, for this is he had no memory of it. He would simply go into this trance, complete the task, and then come back from it, not really knowing what it was that he had said. And yet he changed some of his, some of his foundational core beliefs because of this ability uh, to to have psychic connections with people. Um, one of the things that I read from a skeptic on Edgar Casey was that these healings there there were a few problems with them. Uh, first, the suggestions would be, uh, as I mentioned before, sort of simple. It's like when you go to the doctor and the doctor tells you, "Okay, you need to lose some weight," or your body, your heart is going to have some problems. Your muscles are going to start to have some problems. It's going to be more difficult for you to walk as you get older. And you really need to lose some weight. And the way that you can do that is by having a better diet and a more well-balanced diet. And you can also do that by exercising more. And when we look at some of these readings that Edgar Casey would give for these people, that's what many of them included. Sometimes he would throw in weird things like stripping a rabbit uh, raw and, and licking the inside of its skin. And I can't remember what that was supposed to heal, but it was really weird. Or, you know, just like uh, Gertrude, inhaling the fumes of apple brandy, which is an odd thing to suggest for a, a problem like tuberculosis. The other thing that skeptics like to point out uh, is that sometimes he would give readings for people who had already died. So remember, we're in the early 1900s and people are sending letters. At this point, there's been an article that was written about him in the New York Times that claimed that he was a psychic who could heal people in his sleep. And so people were sending him letters with the things that were wrong with him, them and hoping that he would give them a reading and tell them how to heal themselves. Um, 
he would often give these readings after somebody had already died, not realizing they were dead. And so he would send this uh, medicine or whatever medical relief they were supposed to have. And the response would come from a family member and it would say, yes, they passed away X number of days ago. For me, that's a red flag because we're talking about his clairvoyance and his psychic abilities, but he's giving readings about dead people that he doesn't know are dead. And he should know that if he's a psychic or a clairvoyant, that should be an obvious thing for him. He should have seen that and said, oh yeah, I, that person, they're, they're not with us anymore. Um, but he didn't. He always gave the readings, even if they were already dead. And that's a red flag for me. Uh, I think I think we need to look at those kinds of readings and say, huh, maybe not. Um, I do want to mention that he gave over 8,000 readings that had specifically to do with healing people. Now, that's a really big percentage considering that over his lifetime, he gave 14,000 readings. 8,000 of those had to do with healing people. And uh, it it's... When you look at some of the things that he healed, one has to ask themselves if he really did any healing at all. That's really interesting. In your article, you also mention, like in addition to the healings, he also used, when he went under in that sleep trance, I guess, he used that time to make predictions about future events. So I'm curious to know what events he predicted, supposedly, and also who was doing those that communication as is he is he talking in his sleep or is he making certain faces where his wife would say I think he's saying this or how would he actually communicate what those events are if he's under some kind of hypnotic state while he's asleep yes he made many predictions in his lifetime and they weren't all to do with healing although that was the core of who he was he at one point had established a hospital because healing was so important to him and it was a holistic health hospital. It failed after a few years and barely deserves much of a mention here, except to say that it evolved into something called the Association for Research and Enlightenment, which is located in Virginia Beach today. And you can go there and you can visit it and you can learn all about Edgar Cayce and his prophecies. You can also go for their health and wellness spa, and you can also go there to learn uh, different kinds of practices that are, of course, new age and occultic in nature. So they also, this uh, group, the Association of Research and Enlightenment, which is called the ARE, the ARE also indexes some of Edgar Cayce's predictions. And one of the things that they have on their website is an article that is titled Edgar Cayce's Seven Prophecies That Came True. And I'm not going to highlight all of these, but I do want to mention that he apparently predicted the stock market crash of 1929. He predicted World War II, and he also predicted weird weather patterns like El Nino and La Nina. And so when we're looking at some of these predictions that he made and we're reading some of the words which are printed on this website, it seems like if we're looking at it in light of history, that we can make it fit. But in reality, he didn't say there's going to be a stock market crash in 1929. He did not say World War II is going to happen in this way and this is how it's going to play out. He also just predicted weird weather. He didn't say La Nina or El Nino. He was never that specific, except he predicted Jesus's return. He said that Jesus would return in 1998. He did not, as far as I know. (laughs) Jesus has not returned. And he did not return in 1998, despite Edgar Cayce's very specific prophecy in, uh, on that topic. Edgar Cayce also predicted that China would be mostly Christian by 1968. And I think we can look at China and acknowledge that it is not mostly Christian, and it wasn't definitely 
1968. I think we need to be hesitant when we give much credibility at all to the things that Edgar Cayce said while he was in a trance. One of the biographers that I read talked about how he was prompted sometimes by people and he would have been influenced by things around him. So he would have heard news about rumblings of Adolf Hitler coming to power. He would have heard rumblings about the market and maybe a potential crash coming. And so when he's making these predictions, it's based on oftentimes what he's heard in the news. It's not coming out of nowhere. Now, I will say he's he's made a couple of predictions that are really uh, out of this world. And one of them has to do with something that's called the fifth root race. And he said that this would take over in 2015. It would be the generation of around 2015. And these people would be genetically superior to the generations before them, and they'd be able to achieve a higher consciousness. Now, if you hear the higher, the higher consciousness words, that should trigger people to be thinking about the New Age movement and uh, how we are trying to increase our vibrations, so to speak, so that we can ascend to a higher consciousness. And sometimes this is called the Christ consciousness, which Edgar Cayce has used, did use those words in some of his readings. And so I want to remind our listeners that people like Edgar Cayce think that we can become like God or even go so far as to say that we can become God and gods. Um, and I want to give a warning here that we are creation made in the image of our maker and our God. We are not God. And, and people should be aware that today Edgar Cayce's predictions are being used to support uh, things that are simply just not true. It's really interesting. So if you go to the ARE Instagram page, the entire feed of 5,292 posts as of now in October 2023 is a lot of quotes from his readings and it's really kind of creepy because it's almost, well, I mean, I think some people who are not Christians would say, Oh, well, we quote different teachings in, in a recorded book, but it, it, they almost have like scripture passage, like where you can find it. Like here's his reading. It's this 55 45 dash two or something like that. And so I'm looking at some of the various different things that he said in these readings, which are, you know, could kind of could apply anywhere. But this one says, no self is right, and then go straight ahead. So just all these different kind of, I guess, I don't know, humanistic thoughts. And or keep the face then toward the light, and then the shadows fall behind. What does that even mean? You know, just very vague, humanistic thoughts about self, other people, the soul, um, and those kinds of things. So I think that's fascinating that they've taken it to, you know, almost a, a religion about what his various different readings were. And some of those readings had to do with past things too. So you talked about things that he supposedly predicted, like the stock market crash, which, you know, wasn't really, that wasn't really true. But what else did he have fascination with? You mentioned at the beginning of the podcast, or maybe it was when we were talking before, that he was also... Um, really fascinated with the lost city of Atlantis. I would say that it bordered on obsession. He talks a lot about Atlantis in his readings, and he had a lot of theories about Atlantis and the people of Atlantis. It's for for our listeners. It's a it's not a real city, but at, Atlantis, at least in Edgar Casey's mind, was a real city that he believes was destroyed in 10,000 BC. Now, he prophesied that we would discover Atlantis off of the co east coast of North America in the late 1960s. That didn't happen. Uh, we we still haven't found Atlantis. It's It's not yet appeared. He also claimed that people from Atlantis were technologically superior and possessed the power of the quantum world. He, he talks about how they used crystals and sound waves to heal each other. 
and to create new scientific discoveries. And uh, he also claims that Atlantis was destroyed for a reason, namely their greed and their lust. So it was a punishment that they were destroyed, although he's not really clear who the punishment was from. He never says God punished them, although he did in one reading indicate that it was the great flood that wiped out Atlantis. I wasn't real clear on that reading. And I think if most people read his readings, you'll walk away wondering more than actually having answers. But some people were uh, in Atlantis. They were, became aware that somebody was angry at them. So they escaped. And they escaped with the historical record of their people. And so important was this historical record that they went and they hid it in three different locations around the world. And one of those locations was, according to Casey, the right paw of the Sphinx in Egypt. And so geologists, modern day geologists, have actually done research on the Sphinx in, in Egypt. And we've talked about this on the podcast before. They've sent lasers through through the the Sphinx, and they have found different blank spaces or cavities within the Sphinx. They did not find one in the right paw. As far as they can tell, the right paw is solid. They did, however, find an empty cavity in the left paw. Casey was very specific when he talked about the right paw of the Sphinx and containing this, what's called the Hall of Records. So when you hear somebody tell you that Edgar Casey predicted this Hall of Records exists in the right paw of the Sphinx, we pretty much can be sure that there's nothing in the right paw of the Sphinx at this point. Uh, e Egyptian authorities won't break open the paw because it's a landmark, <laughs> but they have looked at the lasers and, and the, the readings from those lasers and have determined that there's probably nothing inside the Sphinx, even in the empty cavities within. Uh, and so nothing has risen from the ocean to indicate that Atlantis is real. And we haven't found any hall of records anywhere on earth about the city of Atlantis. And so I think we can confidently say that Edgar Casey was mistaken about the lost city of Atlantis. I do want to ask you a little bit more about his other beliefs. And you mentioned already his fascination too with pyramids that we've talked about. We do have a podcast on pyramids and the sphinx and ancient aliens if our listeners miss that um, particular episode but it's interesting at the edgar casey are institute even last month in september 2023 they had a live webinar that they called pyramid sounds raw ta and the chance of the temple beautiful and in there it said that they were going to talk about the great purposes of the ancient temples and the great pyramids and that, you know, specifically they had these acoustical issues that were part of their ceremonies, but they said, we will explore the connection to Casey's advice for us to study this wisdom in order to better understand and expand our beliefs, allowing the flow of energy and information from the universal mind. So that's kind of very interesting. I mean, again, his whole Christian upbringing is nowhere to be found in this idea that we need to follow his advice to allow the flow of energy and information from the universal mind to come to us in 2023. And so what are some of the other things that he believed in? Obviously, the pyramids that you mentioned in Atlantis. And and uh, how did he communicate those? Did he do specific teachings or is it just through all these readings? Because it seems to me just on their feed, a lot of this just comes through some of the readings that he, he did. It's all done through the readings, 14,000 plus readings over 42, 43 years. And the ARE is disseminating information based on those readings. And it's, I, I know at the beginning I said that he didn't seek out to create a religion like Joseph Smith did, but, um, it, it does seem like a religion of sorts has been created off of the Casey readings. And when one reads the ARE website or looks at their social media feed, it feels new agey. And 
and I say that because they talk about vibrations and they talk about ascension and they talk about higher consciousness, which are words that we consistently hear when we're talking about the new age movement and uh, ascending to a, a higher being in oneself. And you do this through number one, reincarnation. And Edgar Casey definitely believed in reincarnation. Reincarnation is the rebirth of the soul in a new body. And its roots are typically in Eastern religions like Hinduism and Buddhism. So we don't find reincarnation in Christianity. It, it's not part of our foundational beliefs. But for Casey, reincarnation was a way of life and it was a way to fix your past wrongs. And that's where karma sort of played out. Karma was the key role in one's reincarnation, right? So if you're good, you'd reap those rewards in the future and your future lives would be great. And if you weren't good, well, your next life would see those consequences play out. And so you wanted to have a good life, but if you didn't, you could fix those in your future life. And Edgar Casey actually believed and, and this perspective is pushed, what you just mentioned, uh, Melanie, is that he believed he was reincarnated from the Egyptian high priest Rata. So many of Rata's teachings are actually given on the ARE website. And I think they're even hosting a conference in the next few weeks about these readings and how Rata played an important part in Casey's life and, and how we can learn from ancient Egyptian, and I don't think they call it theology, but that's essentially what it is. He, Casey, went so far as to uh, reinterpret scripture to fit his needs. So remember, he asked his mom if, if his psychic abilities were from the devil, and his mom told him no. And it turns out that he started to read scripture in a way that would support some of these ideas that weren't actually scriptural. For example, he found in John chapter nine, there is an incident where the disciples are asking Jesus if a man's sin or his parents' sin caused his blindness. And Jesus says, none of them sinned. I'm just showing you the work of God revealed in him. That's, that's what's happening here. But for Casey, he said that the man's disability was karmic baggage from an, a previous life. It doesn't say that in scripture. Jesus never said that. But Casey used that example to support his perspective on reincarnation and to make it okay to promote reincarnation. He also often talked about the planets and the stars in his reading, and he would look at where people's um, birth was in alignment with the planets and the stars and use astrology to give these, these readings. Now, it's interesting because, again, he's supposed to be sleeping in a trance when he's giving these readings, and he doesn't have memory of them when he wakes up. But his whole life and worldview seemed to be around the things that he said while he was sleeping. And um, I think we need to acknowledge that perhaps he knew more than he was maybe letting on when he was awake and, and people were buying into what he was selling. I want to let our listeners know, especially if they're a newer listener to this podcast, that back in January 2021, Lindsay wrote a very in-depth article on New Age, current New Age teacher David Wilcock. And what is the connection between David Wilcock and Edgar Casey? Because I did see mention of David Wilcock to Edgar Casey on their social media feed. David Wilcock is somebody that I wrote a profile for a couple of years ago. He is frequently a guest on the Ancient Aliens show on the History Channel. And he is what we would call a new ager. He says a lot of the things that Edgar Casey said as far as you know, higher consciousness and raising our vibrations and uh, the word ascension. He also buys into what Casey called the fifth root race, which is this genetically perfect group of people that were supposed to have already been born. 
he claims that he is the reincarnation of Edgar Cayce. What I found interesting is that Ancient Aliens just did an entire episode on Edgar Cayce. Now, he has been featured several times when they talk about things like Atlantis and the Egyptian pyramids and the Sphinx, but he's never had a show specifically about him. They did a full hour program on Edgar Cayce for uh, season 19, episode 15, I think, and it just aired in August. Missing from the episode was David Wilcock. He was nowhere to be seen. And I thought that was really interesting. I don't know why he was not featured on the episode, especially in light of his claim of being the reincarnation of Edgar Casey. If you go to David Wilcock's website, you'll find many, many things that explain his connection to Edgar Casey. He has spent a lot of time at the ARE in Virginia Beach. Um, and while the ARE will acknowledge that he looks like Edgar Casey, they will not acknowledge that he is reincarnated from Edgar Casey, which I also find interesting. I read a book called The Reincarnation of Edgar Casey by Winfrey that David Wilcock helped write. And in it, they talk extensively about Rata and Edgar Casey and really drive home or try to drive home the narrative that Wilcock is the reincarnation and is continuing the work of Rata and Casey in this lifetime. And although he has many, many followers, I think I haven't checked his most recent following, but many people enjoy David Wilcock. He was just recently on, I think, Danica Patrick's podcast and many, many viewers listen to that and watch that. He, he's making waves And people should be aware of that because ultimately it comes down to him perpetuating new age ideas that didn't start with Casey, but were certainly highlighted by Edgar Casey. And Wilcott continues to teach those perspectives and people are listening and people are waiting for his prophecies. He says things that are being taken as prophetic word. And unfortunately, Even Christians are falling prey to the words that are being said through Wilcock, and they're buying into the fact that we can become God. And uh, that really makes me very sad for what's happening in our culture and people's lack of ability to sift through and determine truth. So I think spiritually, his life was very fascinating because... Like you said, he had this very devout Christian upbringing, and yet he is subscribing to all of these very New Age beliefs. I mean, you know, I just quoted, we just talked about the Rata and quoted from their webinar back in September and being touted on the History Channel and so forth. So how did he reconcile the fact that he thought he was a Christian, yet thought some of his powers might be from the devil and just basically based on the A.R.E., you know, social media feed has founded this new age, you know, branch of new age religion. I don't think he could. I ultimately do not think he could ever bring the two together. I don't think he could bridge the gap between his Christian beliefs and what he was doing in his lifetime. And only God knows his heart and his mind. And I do wonder how he, at the end of the day, came to terms with it. I don't know that he ever expected for it to turn out as big as it has. And I mean, maybe there was maybe there was a sign when the New York Times read an article on him. But for the most part, I don't think he thought his name was going to live on forever. I don't see a lot of arrogance in Edgar Casey in the readings that I've read through of his and the way people have spoken about him, his children have given testimonies about him. And he doesn't seem like somebody who was arrogant or full of himself. I think it started from a place of, I really want to help people. And how can I help people? And he thought he was doing a greater good. And for him, there could be no good that came out of darkness. And we, of course, we know that darkness can, you know, mutilate good things. And for him, he just convinced himself, 
otherwise. I also think that he was influenced by other people around him. He once gave a reading to somebody who believed in reincarnation and astrology and karma. And it seems like after that moment is when he started subscribing to those ideas. And so I'm wondering if maybe he just started adopting the things that he was hearing and making those as part of his worldview and a part of who he was. I'm not sure if he's reading the Bible every year and knows it. I would imagine he knows it, how he could continue with what he was doing and see that it was okay in scripture. So how would the Christian respond to, well, first of all, when they hear about Edgar Cayce and and his New Age um, worldview, but also they might run across people who are really fascinated by Cayce because once again, the History Channel is so fascinating. You think it's covering actual historical events, which they also do, but they also cover a lot of speculative uh, and occult type of themes on their channel. And so Christians probably come across those shows. Oh, this looks interesting, even after they've watched something like Sound the Civil War or World War II or something like that. So how can they respond when they hear about Edgar Casey? In any way, can we reconcile his beliefs and now how it's been codified in almost this religion to anything in scripture at all. Yeah. The ancient aliens connection is, is really interesting to me because they, they talk about him and they even change his story. And so I'd wonder what he would think if he saw the episode that features him, because in it, they change his story from, it being a woman with wings at the creek to actually being an extraterrestrial and not in the sense of an angelic being, but an extraterrestrial who was imparting knowledge on Edgar Casey and giving him a gift of prophetic powers. And so they've changed the narrative. They've changed what Edgar Casey himself said about his experiences with the woman at the creek and made it into something different. And they, t- they, the ancient alien people profess truth through what they call theory. And so unfortunately, people, when they hear it on a channel like history, they're guessing that it is truth, but it's not. It's simply their theory playing out the way that they want to manipulate the facts to make it play out. As far as Christians responding and the way that Christians should perceive things, we have a truth problem in our culture, Melanie. Truth is really important. And I know I say this virtually every time I'm on the podcast. And I just wish that more people would be paying attention because our culture knows that truth should be at the forefront. Christians know that truth should be at the forefront, but it isn't. And we are succumbing to things that culture is presenting to us because maybe we're afraid to speak out. Maybe we're, we don't know exactly how to speak out. But at the very least, Christians should be questioning the things that they're hearing, and we should be filtering it through, what do we know about what scripture says? Does what we're hearing align with what we know about what scripture says and what we know about who God is? Jesus said he is the way, the truth, and the life. Casey twisted scripture to align his beliefs about reincarnation and karma, And we were warned about that. James Sire wrote a wonderful book about scripture twisting. And he wrote that in the context of cults. But I think it applies to conspiracy theories, too. And that's kind of what we see on Ancient Aliens is a bunch of conspiracy theories put together and created in this way, in this nice package, and they call it truth. The problem is that Christians need to know that Satan knows scripture and he's ready to mess it up. He twists it and he manipulates it. And he tells us that our sin is okay and that our behaviors aren't hurting anyone. But the problem is that we're falling for his traps and his snares. And instead, what we should be doing, Melanie, is putting on the full armor of God. And one piece of that armor is the belt of truth. Truth is vital. And we have to incorporate it in every part of our lives, including the things that we see on television or read in newspapers or in magazines. So we have to sift everything through the truth meter of scripture. 
And we need to keep what is good and right in the sight of the Lord and reject everything else. Well, that's a lot of very fascinating things. And we definitely need to be aware of the occult because it can creep in when we don't, when we're innocuously watching the History Channel, the next program that comes on after something that we've watched about a historical event or something like that. Well, on a much lighter note now, I have a fun question for Lindsay, and it's fall. Lindsay, are you team apple or team pumpkin? <sighs> That's hard. <laughs> I, I can't pick both, can I? So I'm going to go team pumpkin. Okay. Well, I wonder if you're the first person on team pumpkin. I'll have to think about that one. Well, thank you, Lindsay, for being a guest again on the Postmodern Realities Podcast. Thanks for having me. You've been listening to episode 362 of the Postmodern Realities Podcast. Lindsay Mettermolt and I have been having a conversation about Edgar Casey. You can read her article, Edgar Casey, the would-be sleeping prophet, free at equip.org. Stay connected with the Christian Research Institute and all the new content we have coming your way. The best way to do that is to head on over to our website, equip.org. There you will find thousands of free resources right at your fingertips, from articles to video to audio, and it's all for free. You'll find our podcasts hosted there as well as the Bible Answer Man broadcast, which is hosted by CRI President Hank Hanegraaff and streams live every Monday through Friday at 6 p.m. Eastern. In addition, you don't want to miss out on subscribing to Hank Unplugged, which is the podcast of Hank Hanegraaff. And in that podcast, he has really in-depth, free-flowing, essential Christian conversations with some of the most interesting, informative, and inspirational people. And in addition, he has a new series on his podcast feed called Hank Unplugged Shorts, which Hank goes into the headlines in the mainstream media and refutes a lot of those cultural issues that we have in these short podcast episodes. And there's quite a few of them. You don't want to miss out on them. Now, if you want to find some of this at other places where it's all in one place, really subscribe to our YouTube channel. It's a great way to get all of our content there, our podcasts there, and different individual questions theologically that people have that Hank answers at our YouTube channel. Now, you might be thinking to yourself, I don't know how to subscribe to YouTube. I don't have a YouTube account. Well, actually, you might just have a YouTube account. If you have a Gmail address, you have a YouTube account. Just log into YouTube with your Gmail address and search for Bible Answer Man channel, and please become one of our subscribers. In addition, if you see that bell icon right there on our front page, please click that, and every time that we have new content, you will receive a notification that new content is up on our channel for you to be able to consume. So thank you so much for the ways in which you partner with the Christian Research Institute. We are grateful for you listening and reading and watching. Yes.